You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, November 18th, 2021. I was dressed in a bathrobe and a pair of Wellington boots. My imagination reeled as I tried to map out this character as a genuine aristocrat in the age of Downton Abbey. I felt mildly giddy at this apparent glimpse of real life. Welcome to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, where we interview authors, artists, and other notable people from our suburb of Deerfield, from Chicagoland, and around the world. I'm Dylan Zavagno, the Adult Services Coordinator at the Library. Our guest this month is Dr. Paula Derdiger, the author of the wonderful recent monograph, Reconstruction Fiction, Housing and Realist Literature in Postwar Britain. It was published by Ohio State University Press in 2020. Paula is an associate professor of English at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and she grew up here in Deerfield. Her book, Reconstruction Fiction, looks at how historical changes in housing after the Second World War impacted the literary realism of British writers. And as I say in our conversation, it had me rushing to the shelves to read the novels she argues were part of negotiating not just a physical, but also metaphorical rebuilding of society that was undertaken post-war. This is a fun conversation about form and content and style, how writers respond to each other and the world and the social impact of realistic literary fiction. Ultimately, this episode is an enthusiastic appreciation for some novelists who often seem to be unknown to many American readers. We spend some time focusing on the writer Elizabeth Bowen in particular, a favorite of both Paula and I. Here's my conversation with Dr. Paula Derdiger. Paula, welcome. I guess I could say welcome back to the Deerfield Public Library. Thank you. I am just so excited to talk to you about your wonderful book, Reconstruction Fiction, Housing and Realist Literature in Postwar Britain. It is a book that made me run to the library shelves, and I was so excited to keep reading all of these books that you discussed, partly because I was so interested in the time period, but also you were illuminating things about these books, about how realist fiction works and how it relates to our lives. This is a really wide variety of authors with a lot of various commitments stylistically and I think politically. Um, so maybe you could just start by telling us who are some of the authors that you discuss in this book? Sure. So maybe I'll just step back for a second to say that, um, you know, a lot of times academic books in, in the literary studies field um, are really organized around authors. You know, you'll find like a chapter on a certain author and chapter on the next author. And for me, it was really important um, to include this wide variety of writers, but um, not to sort of use writers as a way to organize what I was doing. So you said you were interested in the time period, and so was I. Uh, for me, that sort of the historical moment in some ways is the shaping thing for me. And it's why I'm able, I think, or I, I tried to bring together writers in each chapter that were sort of talking to each other from different perspectives. So it's not just about the biography of one author in each chapter. It's sort of how different types of voices can come together in a historical moment. The writers that I that I look at um, are Elizabeth Bowen, uh, who I know we're going to be talking about later. Elizabeth Taylor, not not the actress, uh, you know, <laughs> really difficult writer to to Google and to find. Um, I remember when I first started reading Elizabeth Taylor, um, I really found I could only get her books in used bookstores just by rummaging around. You know, it was kind of before you could find things super easily online. But uh, yeah, Elizabeth Taylor, Colin McInnes, uh, Patrick Hamilton, another mid-century writer who, you know, I found a lot of used used books and bookstores um, by uh, who else? Um, Graham Greene, probably the most familiar name, I would imagine, to, you know, sort of average American readers. And Doris Lessing, who is also more familiar. So some of those writers are, are writers that most Americans would never heard of, even like well-read Americans, I think, you know, are kind of like, well, who, who are these people? But um, Graham Greene, Doris Lessing, uh, and Bowen are probably the most well-known of, of those writers. 
Well, I am especially excited to talk about Elizabeth Bowen. Um, right now, I am leading a book discussion at the Deerfield Library on her novel, The Death of the Heart. So I think we'll get into more of her fiction later, but can you just tell us who she was and maybe how you first encountered Elizabeth Bowen? Because it's true, I, I a lot of people in my book discussion had never heard of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not very well. I mean, she is well known uh, to some people, but um, I think in American, for the American readers in general, not so much. Um, and she's, you know, I think she's tough. I'd be inter I'd be super interested to hear how your discussion has gone. So maybe if we have time, you can tell me a little bit about that too. Oh, of but, course. Um, yeah, yeah um, Bowen is what is known as an Anglo-Irish writer. So meaning that she uh, lived in Ireland, but her ancestry was Protestant, dating back to the 17th century, so Anglo-Irish. She was born in 1899 and always made a lot of the fact that she was the age of the century, the 20th century. She felt that her life was unfolding sort of in step with the century. And that comes up in a lot of things that she's written that points to her, you know, abiding interest in politics and in the social world around her. She just felt that the events of her time were very much the events of her own, you know, coming into the world. I, I always like to think about that, you know, to remember that that was important to her, the age of the century. So so I should say she was her, lost her mother at a young age and moved from Ireland to England. And that sort of orphan status, orphaned in the sense that she lost her mother, is also something that shows up in uh, a lot of her fiction. Of course, in The Death of the Heart, we have Portia, who is a, a very similarly crafted character. She's Anglo-Irish, she's orphaned, and she also was the inheritor of her family estate, Bowen's Court, which was a big house in Ireland and um, that had been in the family for centuries. She was the last person to inherit it. She herself had no children. Uh, she eventually could not pay to maintain the estate, so... Um, in the in the late 50s, she had to sell it and it was demolished. And so I bring that up because at that point, she went from, from being landed, a landed gentry, uh, to uh, essentially being a middle class. She had to work to support herself. Um, and for her entire le her career, really, she needed money. So, you know, unlike some other, you know, Virginia Woolf, for example, uh, she, she needed to write for money. So she was prolific at both because she was talented and also because she had to be. And so all of these things, her, her Anglo-Irishness, her landed but unlanded status, her orphan status, I think all points to this general quality in her identity that was sort of divided or split. She was always navigating between different poles, let's say, um, that sort of tugged her back and forth. I and mean, she was never quite settled in one place. And I think that quality permeates her work in in so many ways you know not just in the ways she she characterizes her her characters but just in general a kind of a sense of, of being separated from something or pulled in multiple directions uh, is there oh I one other thing I did want to mention about her that has always been important to me is that she worked as a spy during World War II yeah um so sort of spying on Ireland for the British government so uh, even though she was Irish, you know, she was Anglo-Irish and and she she was very proudly Irish, but she also um, was very um, much in support of the Allied cause and, you know, took the neutrality of Ireland during World War II uh, very seriously. So that's something to be investigated. So I bring that up uh, finally because um, my initial interest in Bowen uh, really does tie into my interest in World War II Britain. I, I first encountered Elizabeth Bowen actually in a Newberry Library seminar that I took. I had studied history as an undergrad and was taking, I hadn't, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was doing, working nine to five jobs and uh, knew I wanted to go back to school but wasn't sure what. And so I signed up for a Newberry seminar on modern literary London. I had studied abroad in London, so I had some just affection for London and literature. And uh, we read Bowen's 1949 absolute masterpiece, The Heat of the Day, which is a book that I have taught multiple times. And so we read that, and that was my first introduction to Bowen. And, and I then decided to, to get 
a master's degree in literature at Northwestern, at which point I, I, I didn't know, but at the time, a scholar named Phyllis Lassner was, was, was working there. And Lassner is one of the most important Bowen scholars out there. And so I just happened to meet her and she became a great mentor and longtime friend of mine. You know, that was the beginning of my literary, <laughs> you know, sort of literary grad studies, literary career, so to speak. So Bowen is kind of right there at the beginning for me. Wow. Yeah. Well, I did want to talk about Elizabeth Bowen in relation to Virginia Woolf, because you open your book with a quote, Bowen is writing to Virginia Woolf after the 1940 bombing of Woolf's London home and says to Virginia Woolf, all my life, I have said, whatever happens, there will always be tables and chairs. And what a mistake. And I found your use of this epigraph astonishing because you are making the case that this very unassuming quote, uh, you say it's nothing less than a declaration of historical literary sea change. And you argue it's as significant as Wolf's own declaration that in or about December 1910, human nature changed. Now, that is often cited as one of the great declarations of modernism. So can you just describe maybe the kind of cultural commonplaces we inherit that I've certainly used in book discussions about modernism versus realism in literature and, and how that worked with the world wars? Yeah, um, I'm, it's a great question. It's a it's a complicated question, um, and I will do my best to answer it in a way that doesn't get too long winded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what World War II does in Britain is introduce the experience of a physical transformation, which is to say, the bombing, not and not only the bombing of the landscape, but the preparations for bombing. Uh, of the landscape and this sort of experience of total war that were were brought into being completely changed the way the physical and material uh, aspect of people's lives were lived. And World War One was a war was an incredibly you know th there's no denying that World War One was momentous for for British people as well. Um, almost, you know, every family in, in Britain lost someone in World War I, but it was a, it was a war that was fought on the continent. World War II in part was too, but of course the, the, the bombs came to Britain in World War II. The understanding of World War I was something as slightly removed, right? There was a, a disillusion that accompanied the, the experience of World War I, mainly because the, the political gains of participating in that war were not clear, right? And so we find a lot of, especially in World War I poetry, we find a lot of, right, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, or if your, your listeners would be familiar with this kind of poetry, maybe not, but, you know, the kind of disillusioned soldier, right, who doesn't understand um, any, why he should be fighting, right? What happens after World War I in the period that literary scholars describe as high modernism, you know, is a, is a real interest in, in this alienation, this dissolution, the sort of fragmenting of, of the world that, that we, as we know it, not in a physical sense, but in a, in a sort of perceptual sense, you know, in that sort of basic how I understand things, how I see things, et cetera. Modernism and the story of modernism is really fascinating for all those reasons. You know, it's why we get literature that is so interested in consciousness and subconsciousness and perception, um, because those things are sort of in flux in, at that time. World War II it takes us into the physical realm, where suddenly the physical realm is now not something that we can rely on in the way that we used to before. But World War II, unlike World War I, for, for the British average British citizen, has a, a different kind of moral imperative. Right? There's a sense that Hitler and Nazism and fascism represent an evil that needs to be destroyed. And so there isn't that same there, there isn't that same sense of a meaningless war, right? There are certainly people who who don't want to participate in the war, but unlike with World War One, we suddenly have writers and cultural figures of all kinds supporting the war effort. So mm -hmm. it's a very different relationship between literature and art and war uh, than we had at, during the high modernist period. 
So for Bowen, um, and the reason I chose that quotation, you know, it's it's not just a, so all the all that political stuff is there um, in the background, but um, you know, it's really this uh, this basic sense that we cannot trust the physical world in the way that we used to, and how is that going to change everything for us? And I think her fiction bears out you know, the way that the way that that happens. Well, there's one critic that you quote who calls it poor old realism. And there's this kind of narrative that gets told of literary progress, of historical progress, right? That modernism after World War I kind of launched us onto this new aesthetic realm. And then after World War II, this realist literature was a kind of retreat. And you are arguing very strongly against that. Yes, thank you. You sort of brought me back to the second part of your question, which I didn't really answer. Um, that's exactly right. You know, I think in some ways our our story, the story that we tell ourselves about literary history, you know, remains one of progress, partly because time is linear. Um, but, you know, <laughs> you know, the modernists privilege the idea of the new. And when we tell the story of literary history, I think we are... Mo- that's almost a modernist exercise, isn't it? Because we always say, well, what was new? What came next, Right. There's a difference, I think, between realism as a mode of writing and 19th century realism as a movement, right? Um, okay, and okay. so, you know, my argument is that realism is something that abides much more broadly than the 19th century, even though when people say realism, they tend to mean the 19th century. But I think we know realism is still alive and well today, and it's been around forever, you know. <laughs> Eric Auerbach in Mimesis, the famous account of realism, you know, goes back to the Bible, you know, and, you know, back to the Odyssey to to talk about the presence of realism. So I, I am in line with that tradition of thinking about realism. When scholars in the 20th century make the argument that mid-century British realism is, you know, a sort of sheepish thing, or it's, you know, a sort of banal thing or a boring thing, or you know, just a sign that the artistic talent is gone in Britain. Um, I think that's really missing out. Uh, it's not asking the right question. Uh, it, you know, it, that's that question is what, you know, what is new and privileging that question of what is new. Whereas I think the question should, for me, the more important and more interesting question is how is literature working with history? I think when we understand the impact of the war and what comes after, uh, and then we look at that in tandem with with the literature that's unfolding, it makes complete sense that a realist mode is is being engaged. And the sort of more modernist inward turn is no longer appropriate at that moment, or it's it's a it's a turn away from the social world um, at a time when when that's what's needed is a is an engagement with the social world. Yeah, I feel pretty strongly about about that that argument. Yeah. Well, and then is this why housing became such an issue for you? Because it is about the physical world. I mean, it's one of those things that just kind of underlying everything we do and any realist fiction takes place in different houses and different homes usually. Yeah. I think I maybe say in the introduction to my book that, you know, it's not a, it's not a novel thing to to write about domestic fiction and in, in the British right. literary tradition, you know, it's pretty important <laughs> and omnipresent. But what is unique about this moment is the instability of the domestic. It's not simply that we can see the representation of domestic lives in that in this fiction, but we see it, we see what happens to those lives when when that domestic backdrop is suddenly in, unstable or transformed in some way in a way that is completely new right and completely un- you know, unanticipated and um, disruptive so. well I thought uh, one way of starting to get into some examples here was to talk about Colin McInnes and his book oh, yeah. absolute beginners um, which I just read a few days ago oh it's good such a kind of wild and energetic book I maybe you could I sort of wanted to call it a working class British catcher in the rye because it's kind of that young adult thing, but that's not really fair to either book, I think. (laughs) Um, But it is this very kind of wild narration going into all of these different types of living environments. Mm -hmm. And you connect it actually very explicitly to some of the architecture Mm 
that was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, gosh, it's a really fun novel, and it's a novel that I think gets surprisingly political at the end. I'll get to the architecture thing in a second, but I, I think I have taught this book, and you know, I think in the beginning, students are like, "Oh, it's just like a book about fashion." You know, the the narrator is really interested in fashion and trends and. Um, it's from 1959, Nine, yes. 1959, I'm, I'm not really these things. Um, and, you know, in, in the late 50s in Britain, American culture, American youth culture was extremely influential. And so there's a lot in McInnes's novel, there's a lot of reference to different kinds of music, different kinds of early, you know, sort of jazz music and early rock and roll lots of stuff about fashion, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, So in a way, it just seems like kind of an observational, almost kind of superfluous sort of text. Um, But it ends with this, with the narrator main character getting caught up in the the Notting Hill race riots, which happened in 1959. And so it gets uh, extremely political uh, in a really unexpected way. So I just wanted to say that as a kind of way of framing a discussion of this book because it's uh, it's just one that's so interesting for that reason, I think. The architecture that I link it with um, is um, coming from a, a husband and wife team called the Smithsons, Allison and Peter Smithson, who were were kind of the, the architects of modernizing Britain. It's, you know, if we think of literary modernism as sort of in Britain as, as happening in the early part of the 20th century, it doesn't really happen in Britain until the 50s into the later 50s for various reasons, but the Smithsons were really the sort of heart of this new movement in, in British architecture. And one, so one of their projects, um, it's actually on the, an, an image of it, uh, of the plan for it is on the cover of the book, uh, a plan for uh, a housing development called the Golden Lane Estates. Um, and it's a good example of their style, which was meandering, let's say, uh, organic, meant to to um, emulate the life of the streets within the sort of levels of the housing estate. So, you know, the sort of um, levels of an apartment complex, let's say, in American English. And to me, this this model sounded a lot like the narrative meandering, the narrative organic quality, the the sort of sounds and, and sights of the streets um, that I found in McInnes. So to me, there was this sort of clear echoing of what was going on in, in sort of an approach to writing fiction and an approach to building space. We can look for, you know, thematic representations of housing wherever we read a book. You said, you know, as you said, uh, you know, domestic space is in all realist work and um, all fiction, basically. And that's true. But what also seems interesting to me is that, like, structure, the form of the way things unfold in a text can also feel spatial right? I feel like it's taking us through through space. And um, I forget the very first way you described the book, uh, not fast paced, but... Um, I think energetic, maybe. Energetic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of almost like you, you start at the top of a hill and you're, you know, in a barrel and you're just let go down the hill and yeah. the book just goes and goes and goes. In some ways, I think that, you know, expresses this, this approach to architecture in the modernizing moment, post-war moment, where there's this effort to bring that energy into built space, especially in spaces that are not single family dwellings, but more communal approaches to space. Yeah, breaking up this um, kind of standard family units is certainly happening in the book, but also um, I have the quote from the Smithsons here. Their desire was to drag a rough poetry from the confused and powerful forces which are at work. And it's sort of, you know, we wouldn't call that optimism or utopianism, but it is still a modern plan for the society. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that's such a memorable quote for me, uh, that idea of a rough poetry. I mean, the Smithsons were, the movement they were pioneers of was called brutalism. And probably some of your, your listeners would be familiar with brutalism, the many ugly buildings and the American landscape, too, from the 50s and 60s, sort of giant, monolithic, concrete, bunker-style 
<laughs> buildings. But, you know, for the Smithsons, uh, it, they describe this as kind of rough poetry. And I think, uh, you know, because it was in tune with what was happening. And I just think that's a really historically interesting idea. Absolutely. Well, and McInnes is so interesting because he actually says, well, we're all trying to get at this realist thing, but a lot of the novels you read, plays, TV, it's not doing it. But architecture, that's, that's what really gets you. I just thought that was so fascinating. Yes, yes. <laughs> One of the ways that your book has already changed my thinking and my teaching with uh, my book discussion here is about that standard narrative of modernism that we were were referring to earlier. And one thing I was amazed by was your connection of modernist and Victorian sensibilities, which, you know, we think of this big break with modernism after World War I, but you say, well, actually, you know, this Virginia Woolf idea, modernist idea of a room of one's own is very close to the Victorian desire for individual privacy. And that's no longer possible. No one can have privacy or a room of one's own in this post-war period. So I thought we'd talk about um, Elizabeth Taylor's book at Mrs. Lippincoats. Is that how you say it? Sure. Um, I thought this is such a funny book and just a great satire. The protagonist, Julia, She's living in the civilian house with her military husband. They've taken over the house for the military and her husband's cousin. So it's this totally different kind of family setup than a you know romance plot or marriage plot. And Julia even compares herself ironically or romantically to past heroines of literature, both Victorian and modernist, and says, well, I'm – not like either of them, or, oh, I wish I could be like both of them. Those are both in the category of the past because this new split with reality is World War II and this new living situation. Am I on to that? Am I getting that yeah, correctly? definitely. I mean, you know, I think you you started out by saying, you know, we think of modernism as this big break. And certainly when we just tell a story of aesthetics, that is what we see. I mean, there's no doubt that modernism does make a break. But I think history is never as neat as that, right? And so certain things are continuing. I mean, if we think about the story of the British Empire, the British Empire, you know, a lot of times I think people, some people, people who think of know about the British Empire would maybe have thought oh, the Victorian era is the height of the British Empire, the height of its expansion. But in fact, the high point of the British Empire is between the two world wars. It's, it's really after World War II that the empire falls apart. You know, that's just one example of how modern, you know, 1910 or 1900 is not necessarily the one and only turning point, right? I think in that the, the worldview in which the individual is at the center is something that was very strongly in place, perhaps, you know, still is strongly in place, even with everything that the welfare state ushered in, which demanded that individuals <laughs> put themselves... Uh, <laughs> you know, more into into a communally minded space. Even, even so, I mean, the, the individual persists, right, in Western thinking. Nevertheless, um, I do think that uh, we can clearly see that that worldview very much in play in, in the modernist period. And certainly when you think about canonical modernist texts like Mrs. Dalloway or Ulysses or Portrait of the Artist, you know, with a stream of consciousness style, this is all about how the individual mind works, right? And there's just this real preoccupation with with that internal world. And then, you know, with the turn to realism, we we get a, a turning outward, right? And at Mrs. Lippincoats uses a third person narrator, you know, so we get a view of Julia, you know, from the outside and <laughs> hence the satire, right? And all the irony. Yes, I think you had that that story correct. <laughs> well, it's almost um I mean, it seemed almost like an anti-novel. You you actually describe, I'm going to quote from you here, you say that World War II disrupted traditional relations among individuals and the environments and other people they encountered. Novelistically, this disruption translated to an expression of the desire for narrative development and social growth rendered ironically or with ambivalence 
it seems that, like bread and milk, character and plot were rationed goods within Reconstruction culture. And sometimes you'd be reading this book and just a chapter would end and everything's totally unresolved and now you're just at a new location with a new character and their desires are going to be totally thwarted and unresolved too. Yeah, I think of poor, um, is it Eleanor? Is that the cousin? She, you know, she... um, like many, like many people in the, in the 1930s and 40s had, you know, was a so had become a socialist and had all these, you know, sort of, in many ways, kind of romantic ideas about communism. Um, and she sort of thinks that she's going to become a communist. And then she moves into this communist um, co- commune. Right. And uh, I mean, it's just hilarious because she, you know, She's clearly not cut out for that life, right? She just feels That's uncomfortable. So she wants to get back to her middle class um, individual space, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, our our sense of like her political development is just cut short. You know, she's not going to blossom into this fully developed, politically active character. She's just going back to where she started. Well, there is three kind of reminds me as we're talking about, um, again, Virginia Woolf, it's just a theme that all these writers are responding to the the towering achievements Uh of Woolf. Um, But back to Colin McInnes, I just noted, again, this contrast you make um, with how they describe a June day, Woolf versus Uh McInnes. So I'm going to read the two descriptions here, and then maybe you can... Um, give us a response here. So from Virginia Woolf, in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved, life, London, this moment of June. Okay, and then from Colin McInnes, this quote you contrast from Absolute Beginners, absolutely fabulous June day, such as only that old whore London can throw up, though very occasionally. (laughs) (laughs) yes um it's just a you know i mean it does seem like a little bit like mckinnis is is being pretty cheeky uh he's got to know what he's doing there you know uh, to to echo (laughs) wolf in that way um and it's no doubt a a class uh, issue for almost first and foremost right um you know, the sort of genteel upper middle class Clarissa Dalloway and from, from the Wolf novel and uh, our narrator, our nameless narrator and absolute beginners. He was just living by the seat of his pants and, you know, in touch with a very different kind of London, you know, not only a London that's been through a war, but, you know, just a London that is now populated, not, like, not populated by different groups of people because London has always been populated by all groups of people, but, um, you know, just with an attention to different, a different part of, of that city. Totally. And he's totally rejecting any, you know, <laughs> vertical um, meanings to the self or mythical cities right. or anything. It's just, this is reality straight. Yeah, um, exactly. So I love the story from your chapter four of your visit to the country house knoll i thought i might actually just have you read the first two paragraphs if you're comfortable with that on a summer afternoon i stood in the long portrait gallery at knoll a national trust country house in kent that has been in the sackville west family since 1566 having made my way through several of the 13 staterooms laid out in 17th century decor i paused at the window to look out over the thousand acre deer park surrounding the house the serenity of the view was suddenly disturbed by a figure exiting through one of the wings not open to visitors. He was dressed in a bathrobe and a pair of Wellington boots. My imagination reeled as I tried to map out this character as a genuine aristocrat in the age of Downton Abbey. I felt mildly giddy at this apparent glimpse of real life that had seeped from the house and blurred the seemingly well-manicured National Trust line between house and museum. Knoll as trust museum would never give me access to Knoll as post-war property a prohibition that only intensified my desire to know what that latter version of the house was really like. Post-war Knoll is the version of the house that caused James Lee's Milne in 1946 to feel, quote, horrified by piles of dust under the chairs from worm borings 
The Gesso furniture was in a terrible state. All the picture labels wanted renewing, the silver cleaning, the window mullions bending, unquote. It is also the house in which, quote, the public amused themselves by carving their names on the oak door of the gatehouse on days when they were not admitted to the staterooms, unquote. Would visitors pay to see heirlooms covered in dust and windows smashed from wartime damage? My secret aristocratic sighting reinforced my scholarly desire to access the historical experience that the National Trust conceals, including, perhaps especially, the damaged post-war house. The experience revealed a voyeuristic fantasy at the heart of the Country House Museum that simultaneously accepts and rejects the legacy of the British class system as country houses transform from houses into museums with their velvet ropes and souvenir guidebooks Visual evidence of the lived-in house of both past and present is withheld selectively to perpetuate desires that structure the dominant cultural understanding of class hierarchy and its historical significance. These once private homes become hybrid structures in which public narratives assert themselves in order to mask and mystify the private lives that often still exist somewhere behind the scenes. This is such a fascinating way to start off this <laughs> discussion of uh, another Elizabeth Taylor novel and this Elizabeth Bowen novel, The Little Girls. Um, you're sort of right that they're puncturing this nostalgic museum style narratives that you saw punctured <laughs> by seeing this kind of stray aristocrat. <laughs> um I guess I might start by just talking about The Little Girls. This is an Elizabeth Bowen novel now from 1963. And we have three girls uh, who are women at the start of the book, and they're joining back together. And one of them is trying to create some sort of time capsule in a cave that she owns. And then halfway through the book, we go back into the past, into more the modernist period, really. And we have the little girls trying to make some sort of time capsule. This novel is so fragmentary. I mean, it almost doesn't read like realism. You say that Bowen uses strategies of absence, and I found it so thrilling because I had your book with me. So I would read... Mm -hmm. A, a few paragraphs of your description, and then I'd go back to Bowen, and I would go, wait a minute, something's going on here. I'll just give you one example, and I'd love to hear more of your encounter with this really strange novel. So in that flashback scene, so we have the little girls, and I'm thinking, okay, Bowen is trying to puncture this narrative of museum-style history being represented throughout the ages. And then it's almost a throwaway scene. You have the girls in school and they're reciting poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, their poetry always gets cut short and the teacher says, oh, we ran out of time. And then the girls start like making fun of each other and they're yell. It is unbelievable that are saying, you're ruining the poem. You're ruining the poem. <laughs> and it was like, this is what a realist novel can do. Mm. It can show these characters trying to interact with these great poems, these great narratives of history and say, well, okay, but what does a real character actually do in that environment? Just like, what does a real aristocrat actually do at Knoll? Yeah. Wow. That's so great. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't uh, actually read The Little Girls for a while now, so, you know, <laughs> it's not as fresh in my mind as it is in yours. But, um, you know, that's such a that's such a wonderful point that when there isn't a sort of bigger conceit to something universal or mythical or abstract, um, that 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 interruptive quality of real life can come through, which is so interesting um, because, of course, modernism is... <laughs> loves interruptions, but <clears throat> um, yeah, I love that uh, as a way of, of framing that scene. Absolutely. It's, you know, I, I, I do think that of all the texts that I look at, the little girls is probably the one that is the, is definitely the one that's the least conventionally realist. If you just picked it up uh, and, and someone said, is this a realist novel? Someone, you might not, <laughs> you might not be inclined to say yes. Right. So I think it's the biggest risk uh, that I take in a way in the book. But um, as you just said, um, 
it's what it does is it it captures the realism of something, right? In this case, it's the realism of uh, an experience of the past uh, that cannot be wholly known or wholly represented, right? Uh, through those kinds of narratives uh, that we get in heritage, in efforts of, of heritage and, and recollection and memory and all of that, you know, that all of those things are flawed. In that way, it, it is realist and, and you know, uh, in my in my in that chapter, I I quote her from an essay or from a broadcast that she gave maybe in 1950, the cult of nostalgia, um, in which she talks about the pressing realism of history and how she is like I'm paraphrasing her, but she's first and foremost you know, committed to that uh, that pressing realism of history over and above nostalgia, which she sees as as diluting the, the real experience of. Of history. I think she is a realist in this very committed way, um, but her, her style, uh, you know, so it, it really does push the boundaries of what we call realism in, in that sense. And, you know, some people just might not agree with me on that uh, <laughs> and calling that book realist. But, you know, to me, uh, it's accomplishing something um, that's historically and socially attuned, um, you know, even as it uses those pretty, a pretty disruptive style. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I don't, Ultimately, I don't care because I'm just enthralled right. to it's such a it's such an achievement of artistry. So I thought I'd drill down even more because you mention um, <laughs> you call a uh, Bowen sentence construction relentlessly passive. <laughs> I uh-huh. love that. So I have a few examples here. These are so great. OK, um, this is the one you quote in the book from above around poured onto them the not wholly untender or hostile moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a couple more that I loved. Glimmer still haunted the panes of the empty greenhouse when, having shut its door for the last time, they looked back once. (laughs) And you're saying that these are in service, and I think you can hear it, right? These are in service not of modernist ideals, but of that realism, that post-World War II. So I have one more that (laughs) I loved. Round such existences, nothing but intangibles can accumulate. Colon, they do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's great. great. (laughs) Yeah, that is great. Yeah. You know, um, I went back and was just looking at the death of the heart again, you know, because it's actually been years since I read that book. And one of my, and I was just, I remembered and just reading the first page, how much I loved for the very first paragraph. Um, the swan, swans in silent indignation swam, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, just that phrase, uh, which, uh, you know, shows that she's already doing that passive, you know, the, the, the passive step. Um, but yes, those are all such great examples. And did you have a question or a, something you wanted to say about those? Or Oh, no, I, yeah, I just wanted us to marvel at them. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for me, uh, Bowen's style is is so oblique, you know, her her, her way of taking us to a subject uh, is so oblique. Um, and it's like you have to, and in the little girls, it's like you have to just keep digging through sentence after sentence, flash, you know, the flashback. It's like the reader is digging to get to the action at the end, if there is going to be, right? Because that's what a passive sen- passively constructed sentence does. It gives you the object first, you know, and you're like, well, what, <laughs> where's the <laughs> verb, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, I just think you have to keep digging until you can, until a, a more full view comes into being, such as it is, uh, if one ever does come into view. Well, I thought, um, I would just ask you about the death of the heart because when we were emailing before this, um, you mentioned it being one of your favorite novels and it's mine too. And after reading Reconstruction Fiction, I started to sort of retroactively put some of those ideas and I'm almost wondering, I'm going to read you a passage from the death of the heart that refers to this kind of physicality of the world. Like she is such a writer that is obsessed with houses and homes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's that she's already anticipating the changes that will come from the war. So The Death of the Heart is published in 38. I think it's set in 36. Here, I'll I'll read this paragraph and I think it'll 
make sense to most people, but um, we have, this is describing Portia, who is this orphan who's come to live with her half-brother and his wife. Wondering if this could ever make her suffer, she thought of Windsor Terrace. I am not there. She began to go round in little circles, things that at least her senses had loved, her bed with the lamp turned on on winter mornings, the rug in Thomas's study, the chest carved with angels out there on the landing, the waxen oilcloth down there in Machette's room. Only in a house where one has learnt to be lonely does one have this solicitude for things. One's relation to them, the daily seeing or touching, begins to become love and to lay one open to pain. Looking back at a repetition of empty days, one sees that monuments have sprung up. Habit is not mere subjugation, it is a tender tie. When one remembers habit, it seems to have been happiness. So she, and Irene, that's her mother, had almost always felt sad when they looked round a hotel room before going away from it for always. They could not but feel that they had betrayed something. In unfamiliar places, they unconsciously looked for familiarity. It is not our exalted feelings, it is our sentiments that build the necessary home. The need to attach themselves makes wandering people strike roots in a day. Wherever we unconsciously feel, we live. Yeah, gosh. I mean, you know, um, no one evokes places like Bowen, like spaces, you know? You can Um, see it so much when you're reading. You just see these places more than almost any other book I've read. Yeah, she, she really has this ability to it's more it's more than photographic right it's it's much more cinematic in the sense that what she what she gives us is not only a physical description but atmosphere and Bowen loved atmosphere um you know I'm not sure if you've read any of her ghost stories yes but you know she, she for her houses are alive in this way things objects are alive and you know you can just feel that when she's describing places that she she it's like this energy is just like sizzling off the page you know even though I it's been years since I read the death of the heart like over 10 years I for me like I still have a very clear vivid impression of the house where Portia is sent on the seaside as this uh this little bungalow kind of facing the sea that's being swept by the, you know, by the winter gales, you know, I just, that, that it's just so powerful. My recollection of that um, as this moment for Portia, when she is sent away as the place where she goes exposed little middle-class house. That was a beautiful passage uh, that you read and, you know, just, yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do you think, I mean, was it, it, she's already anticipating, do you think the changes of World War II, was she just so attuned to places that, that became, you know, just a couple years later, that epigraph of, I thought tables and chairs would always be there, how wrong I was. You know, it's possible that at that point she was, uh, I mean, she was drawing on her own experience in a couple of ways. I mean, she did move around quite a bit uh, as a young girl you know so there was that that sort of sense of transience was very much a part of her own upbringing um and also her relationship to Bowen's court which you know at, in the 1930s was you know um you know she's it was still there but uh, the sense of its permanence I think was all you know as, as a physical structure was already in question. And, you know, she witnessed the sort of flowering of the suburbs in the 1930s in Britain and saw that as, as a, definitely a, a challenge to the longevity of something like Bowen's Court. So I think she was always attuned to this, um, yeah, the sense of fate for, for places that, that can't be permanent. Um, and I don't know if you have read um, The Demon Lover, which is one of her short, most yeah. well-known short stories. Have you read that one? Yes, or, I have. Yeah. yeah. 
um, which is just one of her great ghost stories. But it it is set in World War II, and it is very much about um, coming into a house that uh, was once inhabited and now is no longer inhabited, and you know, sort of other people have lived there in the meantime, uh, and so you know, sort of sensing what other people have left behind in a space and this idea that a house carries those traces with it was definitely amplified by all sorts of the exigencies of World War War II. Yes, she was anticipating it in the sense that the things she was already interested in were just going to become front and center, uh, you know, of importance for, for so many people. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I'm I'm thinking back to what you said at the beginning of our talk of her identifying with the century, like she was just so perfectly right. placed to to speak to it. We are uh, running out of time here, but I I'm just you know I was overall very moved by the the general thrust of this work. I think it's easy to talk about empathy, like oh, fiction builds empathy, but I always kind of bristle at that and it's like well what fiction what type of reading like um but you i'm I'm going to quote from your introduction here where you say fiction like actual buildings creates a sheltered space for the mediation between individual subjects and the social and geographical environments that they encounter realist fiction specifically insists that such mediation is possible and that it is socially valuable and that seems like what people think they're talking about when they're talking about empathy and fiction. And that seems like what Bowen was, was really doing as well. Yeah. Thank you. I I agree with you that empathy as a shorthand can be kind of, uh, yeah, it kind of glosses over some things. Um, But yeah, I, I do, I do think that that social function that's coming together function um, of realism is important. Um, When I teach, like a literary history, you know, like a British survey class. Um, and I'm sort of explaining to students um, how modernism sort of departed from Victorian realism or, or how we might understand the difference between texts that are modernist, texts that are more realist, if we want to make that distinction, um, is that modernism, you know, is sort of like a castle with the drawbridge pulled up. Uh. And, you know, readers have to work hard to get inside that's part of the virtue of modernism, right? It's difficult, it's challenging, uh, it's a puzzle, uh, it's very rewarding. Once you get there, you know, um, it's great. Uh, and realism lets down the drawbridge. You know, it's inviting, uh, you know, for the most part. Um, <laughs> you know, whether we want to say little the little girls is an inviting, <laughs> inviting novel, I'm not sure, but to start from a realist mode, I think, is to lower the drawbridge. And you know, I think there there's always been a social value to that. That it's it's just a very different way of approaching writing, right? Uh, as opposed to the modernist appro- that modernist approach. Both are valuable, you know, uh, in the history of literature, sure, of course, you know. But I think in these in certain social moments, I think we need that realist impulse. Well, then let's end by, um, since you do sort of gesture at the end of the book to us being in a time that might be able to use some realism, Mm. um, if you could speak to that or maybe some of your favorite working novelists today that um, excite you in this area. You know, I am not as up to date with contemporary literature as I should be, or as I'd like to be, I would say. I, you know, my quick answer is that Zadie Smith is, is the social novelist of her time, you know, in British literature, in, in lots of important ways and good ways. The other writer who I was thinking about um, that I have really admired in recent years is Rachel Cusk, who, mm. you know, her outline trilogy, which I think is absolutely stunning. I, I'm not such a big fan of her other work, but I do think <laughs> that this trilogy is remarkable. Um, and I, I don't know that it's, I mean, it is realist. I don't, it's not so socially in tune as as A.D. Smith, but it almost seems to be in that Bowen tradition of giving us, giving us reality obliquely, Um, you know, and so I I do see some of that uh, present in in her work. Um, And, you know, if we had longer to talk, I'd be, you know, I'm so, I'm, I'm fascinated by the sense that, you know, we live in a digital world and our, again, our relationship to the physical has completely changed, um, you know, in a way that 
it, it hadn't even when I began working, like when I began graduate studies, it was like it was a digital <laughs> world, but it the full force of, you know, what a world lived online and on phones means for everything. So yeah, what are, what are the realists going to do? And I teach a class on, on World War II fiction. And when the pandemic happened, I was teaching that class. And I remember when it first started, I, I was teaching that class and we, we moved online. And I remember, you know, saying to the students, it seems like we're in another moment where there's this isolation and this alienation. And I wonder if there will be some, I wonder what will emerge in, a, in the literary world after this process it and if it will be a sort of moment where there's a return if we will <laughs> to realism or a new kind of realism to to reckon with all of this stuff or or not um so i don't know that was a you know half an answer to your question but i it's a big question mark i think you know what who, who are the if who and who are the important villas going to be if if they are if they are going to be yes Oh my gosh, amazing. Um, well, this has been such a joy. Thank you so much, Paula, for joining us. Thank you. This has been so great. You know, never in my wildest imagination, <laughs> you know, what I have imagined when I was a child in Deerfield, <laughs> that someday I would be, you know, talking about a book that I'd written. So it's a real uh, pleasure to just have this opportunity. You can find Dr. Paula Dertiger's book, Reconstruction Fiction, here at the library in our podcast collection. Or we'll also link to the PDF of the book. She has it available open access through her university webpage. We'll link to that site as well, where you can find more information about Dr. Dertiger and her work. That's our show. Thank you to Paula for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you for listening to our 51st interview episode and the end of our fifth year. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in our show notes. We take December off, but we'll be back next year with more conversations with authors, artists, and other notable people from Chicagoland and around the world. Thanks for listening. Thank you.